Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar titled The Application of Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification for Safer Built Environments, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Shamiz Allard and I'm the Knowledge Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, also known as ONF. ONF sponsors the Fall Prevention Communities of Practice, Loop and Loop Junior, along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. So as always, uh, before we begin, I'd just like to give you a quick rundown of the Zoom meeting platform. Your screen may look a little bit different depending on the type of computer that you're using, but if your Zoom application is opened in full screen, you can double click or press the escape button on your keyboard or in the top right corner of your screen to exit. Um, the webinar technology does consist of two parts, which are audio and visuals, and both are provided through your computer monitor and speakers. To test or adjust your audio settings, look for the audio settings or join audio button in the bottom left corner of your screen. And this will provide options for testing your computer microphone and speakers. So then now if you look to the bottom center of your screen, you'll see buttons that allow you to access the chat box raise hand and Q&A features on Zoom. So the chat box allows you to send messages to you know, the webinar panelists or webinar participants. If you wanna use the raise hand button, you can do so and you can, uh, that'll allow you to connect with me. And you can submit questions through the Q&A box, which will be answered at the end of the webinar. So you'll only be able to view questions that you ask, not questions posed by other participants. So now to simplify things for any technical questions. So for example, you can't hear the presenters or you're having um, you know, issues um, viewing the slides or any of that kind of stuff, you can use the chat box to reach out to us. But for all topic related questions, use the Q&A box um, and we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. And then if you need to leave the webinar at any time, click the red leave meeting button in the bottom right corner of your screen. So if you have any questions about the technology at any time during the presentation, please type them into the um, chat box. My colleague Marguerite and I will be monitoring this. You can also email me at shimiza.alart at onf.org and I will work with you to resolve any of your technical issues. So the webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent out to all participants in about a week along with the presentation slides. But all of our other webinars are also recorded so you can view previous recordings um, through accessing the webinar page on the Loop website. And you can click see our archived webinars to get access to those. So I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Julie Sajek. Julie is a best-selling author, professional speaker and designated Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Professional. She is an accessibility strategist and owner of Sawchuck Accessible Solutions. For a complete bio of Julie, you can view the Zoom webinar invitation. So now without further ado, please take it away, Julie. You may now share your screen. Goodness, that's not a very good start, is it? Are you seeing my screen? No, we're not. Oh, okay. do you want to try to reshare? Yep. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, afternoon here in Ontario. Beautiful day. How about that? Yes, perfect. There. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for the introduction, Shamiza, and I'm very excited to share, you, uh, share with you a little bit about my story and about the story of the Cowbell Brewing um, Company that is in my little town, village actually, of Blythe. Am I able to, this will be a great time to have my camera on. Can you do that, Shamiza? So just at the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll be able to see a button that says start video. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Nope. That's okay. 
we'll go to video um, after maybe at the end when we have some questions. Time. Yeah, for maybe when you're not sharing your screen in the Q and A, we can definitely. Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm going to be telling you guys a little bit about myself and then all about the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Program as it applies to a project that is near and dear to me, and that is this building right here, the Cowbell Brewing Company in Blythe, Ontario, which is the little village where I live just outside of. And it's a story that's near and dear to my heart because it's the very first project that I was involved with after my injury. Um, what you see here is two of the books that I have published, I uh, have authored and published. The one is called Build Your Space, and I wrote it after I built my own accessible home. Uh, we moved in about a year and a half ago, and we learned so much in that process that I decided I needed to write a book about it so that other people would have the benefit of learning the same things that we learned in the process. And the second book that was just published in March is called Roadmap to Recovery. And that is kind of the story of my journey of the last five years. I sustained a spinal cord injury in 2015 at the age of 41. I was a high school teacher. I am a mom of two and I have a husband. We have a farm. And it just flipped my life upside down. And you don't know what you don't know about spinal cord injury until you are in the situation of having to recover from one. So I wrote that book along with support from Spinal Cord Injury Ontario, and that is a free resource available at their website, Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. And I hope all of you therapists already know about this book. And if you don't, um, that you will go and download a copy for yourself or order a paper copy and share it with any of your clients who themselves have spinal cord injuries. Anytime you want to reach me, you can email me at julie at juliesawchuck.ca and my book is um, Build Your Space is also available from my website or on Amazon. So that's just a little bit about me. We are going to be talking a little bit about the Rick Hansen Foundation. We're going to talk a lot about Cowbell and how the RHFAC certification program applied to that building. And I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about the program itself and the, a brief discussion about the cost benefit of designing and building accessible spaces. And then at the end, we will have time for question and answers. So if you are located in Canada um, or have any connections to Canada, I'm sure you know the man, Rick Hansen, who is responsible for all of this. He, um, 33 years ago now, did the Man in Motion World Tour where he traveled the world in his wheelchair rolling up and down every mountain that he could find across the world. It took two years, two months, and two days, and any weather, and he really is an amazing man. And as he finished his tour, he raised money and started the Rick Hansen Foundation, and that's where the RHFAC program has evolved from, is the, the beginnings were with the foundation itself, and I myself, not only am I an RHFAC certified professional, I am also a Rick Hansen Foundation ambassador. And normally I am speaking to students in schools and would be, you know, maybe at this time of year speaking to students in schools, but of course everything has become virtual, just like um, these conferences and webinars are popping up. And I'm really, excited about it because it it broadens our reach uh, through the foundation and allows us to talk to people like you and your um, your clients and the patients that you work with will benefit from the learning that you hear uh, today from me and I'm going to give you a few statistics but I know most of you are probably already familiar with these that disability touches the lives of almost 50% of Canadians. And although it may not be um, directly 50% of Canadians identify as having a disability, but 22% of Canadians do. And when you expand that to friends and family, a person with a disability doesn't travel by themselves all the time, right? So they are traveling with their friends and with their family. So all of the spaces that they are going to 
need to be accessible spaces in order for them to participate, whether that's a restaurant or a rec center or whatever, an office building. So through the RHFAC certification, we are trying to get as many spaces as possible to be accessible um, and to meet a standard. And it's not, it's not a standard of building code. It's a standard of beyond building code. I call it BBC, building beyond code. And I'm going to read you this quote. Uh, we feel overwhelmed with gratitude when a business makes the effort to ensure that families requiring an adult change table are welcome and thought of. It's like they rolled out the welcome mat for us. It's a really big deal. And that is from Kelly Elliott. She lives just um, about an hour away from Blythe here. And when she heard about Cowbell, she knew that it would be a place that her whole family would be able to go and have lunch because her son has a disability and requires the use of an adult change table. And there's not very many places where that is possible. So when I spoke to her about Cowbell, she was over the moon with excitement about how wonderful it was. And this is the whole building. Um, as you can see, it is, <laughs> it is a beautiful space in the middle of the countryside. And um, it really stands out in, in, this little, in this little village. And it was the first project that I was involved with after my accident. And I, I, I knew the family. It's a family owned and operated business. And I reached out to them and said, you know, I understand that this project is, is already started, but I would really love to be a part of your team to give you any feedback about making it accessible and I went and met with the family and the architect and this was when there was no building it was still a hole in the ground and that way that as I'm sure you all understand is the best way to develop and build something to be as accessible as possible rather than to go back and retrofit spaces that is quite a difficult thing to do so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through well I'm going to roll you through I always say walk when Really, I'm not walking, but I'm going to roll you through all of the different aspects of the RHFAC process from parking to washrooms and meeting spaces um, using the cowbell example as we go. And I'm going to start with uh, a shot of the interior of the restaurant and you can see big wide open space with lots of um, space between the tables and a quote from Stephen Sparling, the founder and CEO of Cowbell. One of our design objectives from day one has been to create a truly accessible facility, one that meets and exceeds all requirements. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do. And that has been a conversation that Stephen and I have had multiple times. And even when they received their gold certification, they said, okay, what else can we do to make this place as accessible and welcoming and inclusive? for all of our guests. So looking at the RHFAC categories, um, we are going to look at all of them except two, but there are, um, well, just because those two don't apply to this particular building, vehicular access, exterior approach and entrance, interior circulation, interior services and environment, sanitary facilities, AKA washrooms, uh, wayfinding, and, wayfinding and signage, emergency systems, and additional use of spaces. And that's where we get into things like offices and restaurants and shops and all of that kind of thing. So the built environment or pre-construction ratings, including commercial, institutional, and public buildings, as well as multi-residential buildings, trails, and pathways. RHFAC does not, at this time, look at um, single unit residential dwellings. So we're going to start out in the parking lot and there you see my car in the parking lot with a nice wide um, passenger uh, unloading area for vehicular access. And what you see in the table on the right hand side are some of the aspects that we look at when talking about parking, um, parking specifically. And what you are seeing here is the curb ramp as one example of the parking where we can see that there is a color change, a color contrast between the sidewalk itself 
and the entrance to the drive through area of the parking lot. So that is one aspect um, where you can see Cowbell has done well with their signage, both painting it on the pavement and the vertical signage as well, having the access aisles so that a person could park on the right, sorry, on the left or on the right, being able to access um, that nice wide space to get my wheelchair out of my car. And there you have a clear view of it. And now because that table is out of the way, we can see the tactile attention indicator that is right at the top of that pedestrian crossing um, that will notify somebody who is using a white cane that they are about to enter, in, enter into the flow of traffic into the parking lot. So all of these aspects are very important, obviously, when it comes to reducing trip hazards, um, especially when you're dealing with a curb ramp that then comes up through the, the rest uh, to the rest of the parking area. Color contrast there between the light surface of the sidewalk and the dark of the tactile attention indicator. Obviously for a straight flow of traffic, of pedestrian traffic and smooth access for vehicle traffic to see that that is a pedestrian crossing zone. And there's another view of the parking lot showing that the vehicle access, the pedestrian access is on um, both sides of those two parking spaces. So drivers have a choice of where to park. And we're also going to look at the aspects of universal design with each of these components, um, with each of the features that we're looking at in the RHFAC. So here we are seeing the design creating awareness and creating the aspect of people being well and safe as they travel from their cars. So next we're going to look at the exterior approach and entrance. And here we have highlighted the idea that the entrance is easily identified. And as you can see, there is a great big sign that says Blythe Cowbell Brewing that you see as soon as you drive into the parking lot. And you see also the overhang of, um, that's over top of the sidewalk that leads up to the main doors, which are behind this tree and under this area right here. There is a fountain here that gives an auditory signal that you have come to a different place in that you are approaching to the entrance. There are safety bowlers um, located in front of those doors. That's another safety feature um, in the, the, the rating survey. There's some seating outside. And one of the unique features about this whole sidewalk is it's actually heated um, for ice and snow melt in the wintertime, which is another safety fall prevention aspect that Cowbell included. Um, there's been maybe one time with the right temperature and the direction coming, the wind coming right out of the north where the snow melt couldn't keep up with it. Um, but other than that, that sidewalk is always clear every time I am at the restaurant, which is probably more than I can afford, but it's an awesome place to hang out because it's so accessible. Here's another uh, view in a different weather condition. This is, um, you can see here the, the signs set up for curbside pickup. So this was during pandemic um, where people were able to drive right up to the curb and pick up their food um, that was run out from the restaurant by the staff. Very clear entrance. In terms of universal design goals, again, creating awareness and understanding that this is where the entrance was and that it was easy for all guests to see. And then we move on to interior circulation. Uh, specifically, we're looking at corridors and hallways here, and we are upstairs in the Cowbell, in the Cowbell um, Brewery, where you can actually see the beer being brewed and canned. And this is the hallway that leads down to the brewery itself. If you were, um, uh, so you're seeing me there and if you're on my right and look down, you can see the bar. And if you're on the left, you can see down into the restaurant. So if you're on Lori's side there. Um, and I love this picture because it really demonstrates the width of this 
uh, hallway where two different mobility devices are able to travel side by side and still clearly have enough space that we're not cr crushing into each other. And there's a different um, perspective of the same hallway space. Now you're able to see down into the brewery and uh, if the canning line was running, you'd be able to actually see the people at work there. You'll also see that they have tours that are self-guided. They also do, well, they used to do um, in-person tours with all of these um, televisions set up along, along the path. There's another one up here that help people understand the whole process of the brewing that takes place uh, on site. So from a hallway corridor perspective and universal design, we're looking at the, um, the idea that, you know, multiple people can travel in that space at one time. And it, especially in times of having to be physically distanced, allows for the space um, for people to do that. And now we are looking at the restaurant itself. We are standing up on that catwalk where Lori and I were looking down at the restaurant. And we're looking at specifically at the arrangement of seating within the restaurant itself. And you can see that there is a lot of room to get around, even when chairs like people are sitting in those chairs, they uh, there's still enough room to get around and staff keep keep uh, uh, those paths, they measure them every morning. They actually take a string and stand up here and then they measure and hold that string all the way down through the tables so that they have those tables lined up and they keep that space clear for people who have mobility devices that they use. From a universal design perspective, Again, we're looking at the body fit idea that it's comfortable, nobody's in your personal space and allows yet for social integration and comfort of all people who are using the restaurant. And it's pretty straightforward. They just take away the chair and uh, somebody using a wheelchair like myself would just roll right under the table. Just keeping an eye on the time. Then we get to my favorite spaces. What? Favorite spaces? Bathrooms? That's ridiculous. It's true um, because it's the most important room in a building, in a home, a restaurant, in a recreation center, wherever it is. Um, having a great bathroom makes a difference. And I have spent a lot of time in the past five years in bathrooms, talking about bathrooms, learning about bathrooms, measuring things in bathrooms. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to share more bathroom information with you. Um, later on, you can send me an email or whatever. It's, it's become a specialty of mine. And this is my absolute favorite bathroom. Um, and it is, the, it is one of two bathrooms in Huron County that has an adult size change table. Um, the other one is at a medical facility in Wingham. So, you know, having access to an adult size change table is a real game changer for people. And the only way you can do that is by having a universal washroom that is big enough to house a device such as this. It, it does take up some space, um, but in the end, the, the people that you welcome to your building, like Kelly said in her quote earlier, it's like rolling out the welcome mat, that everyone is welcome here. Uh, Gosh, there's so many things that I could talk about in terms of having an accessible bathroom, but two things that I want to point out that um, a lot of people don't think about is having a toilet seat lid that a person can lean against so they're not leaning against the plumbing. And this really applies in commercial bathrooms. Um, essentially, I would be leaning against that plumbing because I don't have the core support to support myself when I'm seated sitting on the toilet and also having the drop down grab bar that is on the opposite wall from the L bar um, on the wall beside the toilet because then that gives me something to lean on side to side um, and yet keeps that transfer space open for somebody who would maybe transfer from 
the right hand side of that toilet. So a uh, seat lid and a drop down bar. Those are my bathroom tips of the day from Cowbell. Looking at their hand washing system. The other reason why this bathroom is so awesome is because I can roll into the sink, put a break on if needed, probably don't need to. Um, and I can wash my hands, use the soap and the hand towel and put it in the garbage without moving. There's really not much point in rolling up to a sink, wetting my hands, putting soap on them, washing them off, and then having to roll over and find the paper towel because then my push rims are wet. And the same for any mobility device. So, um, and then I can, you can see in the mirror, I can just use my elbow and hit the door open button that's right behind me there and roll right out of the bathroom. So it's about proximity to all of those accessories in the bathroom that is really important. Looking from a universal uh, design perspective, all accessories at an accessible height, all of those things that I just talked about. Wellness, especially in times of lots of hand washing. Signage and wayfinding, I, I always say them the reverse, but I wanted to point out the um, the benefits of using something what we call a blade sign. And that's basically just a sign that sticks out from the wall that has both words and symbols on it. So somebody down a hallway would be able to see that um, blade sign above the elevator. This is the location of the elevator. Um, they're especially handy above washrooms when they are down a long corridor. Um, this is the family washroom sign that is located on the latch side of the door of the washroom um, that we were just in. The goals of universal design in terms of signage are, again, creating awareness and understanding that that is where those facilities are located. Um, oh, just to talk about uh, raised um, characters, those, raised, those um, symbols are raised on the surface of this sign, and they have added the braille uh, that says family washroom underneath the words family washroom. Emergency systems. Um, all we're going to look specifically at, oops, specifically at the ground level access and the visual fire alarms. All um, new construction require visual fire alarms in Ontario. I know that is a part of the code and especially in areas where people are going to be by themselves, like in washrooms. But at Cowbell, they have put those um, visual fire alarms throughout the restaurant. So anybody... Um, who might not be able to hear the audible fire alarm would see the strobe flashing. That's what it looks like up close. Um, and it's a super bright flashing strobe. Um, any, of, any of you that have seen those will know what I'm talking about. And there you see the ground level exit from the emergency exit stairwell that also has um, an evacuation chair at the top of the stair. So in case of fire, the, um, the elevator would not be in use and anybody using a mobility device or not able to get down the stairs would be um, assisted with the evacuation chair down the stairs and out onto the level platform that takes you right out into the parking lot back to that very spot we started the tour with. Um, from a universal design perspective, we're talking about wellness and awareness, safety, Safety's first, always, um, when talking about accessibility. So here we are back to the uh, outside of the building. Um, I want to point out one of my favorite features, and that's this green roof. Um, it's growing on top of the, uh, the covered walkway area there. Love it. And another quote from Stephen Sparling. Most changes were really small changes with small price tags. If we were retrofitting, it would have been a lot more challenging. But as a greenfield building, we were in a great position to implement strategies from day one. We are committed to doing the right thing. Third party validation of claims is an integral part of our journey. And that is again, Steven, Sp Steven Sparling, founder and CEO of the Cowbell Brewing Company. And I'm gonna show you um, in a minute what 
he's talking about in terms of third party validation. And really it's, it's not just Julie Sawchuk going in and saying, oh yeah, this building's really accessible. I mean, I do that all the time, but it doesn't hold the weight that a third party validation does. And that's where our HFAC has um, the, the backing, not just of the Rick Hansen Foundation, but also of the Canadian Standards Association. And doing that gives it the, the oomph, the people really get that this is an important process, it says a lot and it means a lot. And when we're talking about certification, we are looking at um, meaningful level of access for all users, not just guests, but staff as well. And it awards certification based on minimum requirements and it always provides an opportunity for a building or a site or a workplace to showcase their achievements um, through media with a, a plaque that you can put up in your building um, as well as all of the awareness that you can create through social media. So looking at the levels of certification, there are two ways you can be certified as a building. You can be accessible, uh, accessibility certified, and that's if you score between 60 and 79%, and you can be accessibility certified gold when you achieve more than 80%. And um, there are certain mandatory gold certification requirements that must be met. Um, some of those things that I talked about earlier about um, like tactile indicators at the top of stairs and uh, visual fire alarms anywhere where someone would be uh, independent. So those are just some of the mandatory gold certification. And if you do not um, meet the minimum mandatory certification requirements or you are less than 60% for your building, then the site has some work to do before it can be um, designated as certified. And I have talked to you about all of these categories already, um, but the residential units and the trails and pathways is something that would be added in if those um, were a part of your site. For example, like if you're working in a hospital, um, you would be looking at the residential units as well as if there were trails and pathways on the hospital grounds. I'm thinking about uh, Parkwood Institute when I was there for my rehab. Um, pretty much all of these, yep, all of these would be a part of that rating if the building were to be rated. So I talked a little bit earlier about code and building beyond code. And um, here's some interesting numbers. 42% um, is the RHFAC rating score that a building would achieve if it was built to the OBC, the Ontario Building Code. So just doing OBC, a building would achieve for approximately 42%. So it would not achieve certification. So this is where you see um, that RHFAC is so much more than building to code. Uh, and then if we're looking at it from a national perspective, we go outside of Ontario to the national building code, um, that building would achieve a 35%. So, and that is a cost comparison study done through HCMA uh, relatively recently, January 2020. So that's with all 2018 updates from the um, national building code. And of course, the number one question is how much is it going to cost to make my building accessible? And in that same study, the, uh, the outcomes were really astounding that the average increase to construction cost to achieve gold compared to the national or the Ontario building codes was 1%. Now that's for new construction. Obviously that would be different um, if you were talking about renovations, but 1% and think of that 20 to 50% of the Canadian population that the accessibility will be used by and appreciated by and the impact that it would have on your business. And then 0.4% is the average increased construction cost to achieve RHFAC gold for an office building. So this applies to all buildings, 1%. If you're just talking about office spaces, it's only 0.4 of a percent. So 
really, it's a no-brainer. The cost for new builds to achieve RHF uh, accessibility certified, just certified as in not certified gold, um, when thoughtful planning and design are applied, zero dollars. Again, that's all data from the HCMA uh, study, which can be accessed through the Rick Hansen Foundation website. A little bit more numbers to throw at you. We're just about, we're just about through. Um, $316 billion will be added to the Canadian economy annually as real spending by people with disabilities grows, representing 21% of the total consumer market. So think about all of those 22 to 50% of the population who either have a disability or associate with someone, travel with someone, shop with someone with a disability, um, and all of the disabilities that are temporary disabilities. We will all be affected at some point in our life. $316 billion is a lot of money to be spent by those people, and it's there. $16.8 billion is the increase to the GDP if workplace improvements were made, allowing over half a million Canadians with disabilities to work more hours. Some of the, if you haven't figured it out already, benefits of RHFAC certification and universal design. You're attracting a more inclusive, diverse staff and customer base. You can differentiate yourself in a, in a really competitive market marketplace. Um, fewer future retrofits. And uh, we all know that doing it right the first time is way less expensive than going back and doing retrofitting. Be like Cowbell and be visionary and a leader. Um, they're the only brewery in Canada to be certified. And it's just the right thing to do, improving access and benefits for everyone involved. So what can you do as a therapist or as a, somebody who is working with people with disabilities? Maybe you are in a building where you think um, accessibility needs to be improved. All of these things apply to you. You can take advantage of RHFAC training as a part of your professional development. You can ensure that as renovations or new buildings are built as a part of your industry or as part of your business, um, that you include the participation of somebody like me, an RHFAC professional, who can look at the plans on paper so much easier to move a line on a piece of paper than it is to move a wall. Uh, set a goal for those plans of, of achieving RHFAC gold. Excuse me, and incorporating those RHFAC standards in your accessibility policies at your workplace. So now we have some time for some questions, but I wanted to point out to you the, um, the banner here at the Cowbell. When um, Stephen talked about third party certification, they have a lot of third party certification and not just for accessibility, but for especially for sustainability. They're a carbon neutral brewery. Um, they have a sustainable forestry, forestry initiative and they were so excited to be able to put these two newest banners of the accessibility certified gold for the restaurant and the brewery. So I will turn it over um, to Shamiza to talk about um, how we're going to work some question and answers. She is going to send you um, a link to, for you to give feedback about my presentation today, and that's at rickhanson.com slash events dash feedback. And I also wanted to make sure that you have a chance to send me an email. I, like, I jammed all this into 40 minutes because there's so much to talk about, and I apologize if I was, um, too fast for you to take notes. Um, I have a lot of information to share with you and I invite you to send me an email. Um, one of the things that I'd like to share is the seven most common mistakes that people make when designing and building for accessibility. Um, so send me an email and I will send that off to you so that as you start working on accessibility projects or maybe you're already working on accessibility projects in your workplace um, or you wanna help people that you are working with, that your clients um, or your patients, I want to help you 
let them not make those same seven mistakes as they do their own accessibility project. So email me at julie, julie at juliesachuk.ca. Uh, I'll put that in the chat and just make sure that you spell my name right, S-A-W-C-H-U-K. Lots of people like to put an extra C in my last name. And there it is again. So I'm going to unshare my screen. Oh, actually, Julie, if you want to keep nope. it open, just in case if yep. you want to refer back to any particular slide sure. or like that. Yep. Um, so while you're doing that, so I did throw in um, the event feedback that's on behalf of the Rick Hansen Foundation. So if you guys want to take a look at that, but I did want to, and I'll get to it later, but there will be a Zoom um, evaluation that's sent automatically as well. So there are two different evaluations. So if you have some time, feel free to take both. But in any case, uh, thank you so much, Julie, for this really, you know, wonderful presentation and sharing your, your extensive knowledge about planning for accessibility. Um, and I know we didn't, we didn't get to discuss everything in so much detail as you may have hoped to, but in any case, everybody will have access to the webinar recording, so you can feel free to take a look at that after. And um, the slides will also be circulated. In fact, they're already posted on loop, the slides, and the re webinar recording will also be posted on loop. So that's just a bit of admin stuff. But we did have a question in the Q&A. And also feel free, if you have any questions right now, to start throwing them into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll start um, answering them shortly. So let's see. So Julie, you can see the one in the box, right? Yes, I can from Christiane. Yes. yes. Uh, when a business brings an RHFAC professional to consult, does the RHFAC pay for that or is there a charge to the business for that? Uh, yes, there is a charge for that. Um, you would be paying the, for the professional services of that professional to come and look at your building. Um, there are fees also that are paid to the Rick Hansen Foundation and the Canadian Standards Association. Um, uh, Hans Edgar is asking, I noticed that the plumbing under the sink was wrapped. Can you explain why that is important? Yes, I can. Uh, especially for somebody like myself who is rolling in under the sink, those pipes would transfer heat from the hot water uh, from hand washing. And if my knees were to touch up against that, there would be the possibility that I could scald my skin from the hot water in those pipes. Okay. And so, that is actually something that I experienced in my own home because my sink uh, design wasn't the way it was meant to be. And I actually did burn my skin one day. It was not fun. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, it, like, like, talk about learning um, from mistakes. That was, that was a big learning. Absolutely. So if anyone, we do, have a, we do have a fair bit of time. So if you guys have any more questions, feel free to throw them in. But if you prefer to you know, communicate with Julie privately as well, you're welcome to do so. She already provided her email. Um, it's julie at juliesawchuck.ca. And again, this will be included in the slide deck. So we'll, we'll hang on for a few more minutes if anybody has any additional questions. I'm wondering if there are practitioners out there that um, could think about the, like, accessibility in your building, what would be the biggest challenge that you see, you know, it, whether it's the bathroom, whether it's the main entrance, whether it is access to a particular office space, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge in your facility? Maybe people could just pop that in the, the q and It doesn't have to be a question, just maybe make a statement. What do you think you need the most help with? So there's some, so there's some responses in the chat box. So one yep. individual wrote big challenge, bathing in bathrooms, Mm -hmm. practice home setting. Do you know any of the um, platform style top lips? So we can get to that one, but then somebody else also wrote the parking line to give a wide area for a car door seems like something easy to implement that I've never yeah. thought of before. 
Yes, very easy to implement. Then next time those parking lot lines get painted, you add a two meter wide access aisle um, between every other accessible parking space and then it can be shared between those parking spaces. Uh, Hans is asking, how long is the course to become an RHFAC professional? Um, and, and can I talk about a little bit about this? I did the um, professional certification in Vancouver. I traveled from Ontario to Vancouver to do that certification. At that time, it was a two-week course. Now, um, I believe a lot of the courses are being offered online throughout the country um, through different college, um, through different colleges like SAIT in Alberta and um, oh my goodness, I've just drawn a blank where in Ontario. Um, Brian Melnick says, this is great stuff in this day of needing to find and demonstrate the scientific evidence base for guidelines and standards for different health clinics. What has Rick Hansen Foundation done? Is this evidence based publicly available? Uh, oh, I just lost that question. Can it be put up again? Oh, it's in the answered bit. Let me. Oh, I'm, it is in the answer bit. It. Oh, yep. Okay, got it. Um, the science and evidence base for guidelines and standards. The, the standards are coming from, um, the standards themselves are coming from the building codes, the Ontario building code and the national building code, mostly the national building code. But then there's a whole team of people that have supervised the production of the RHFAC standards uh, from all different types of um, community groups, disability um, advocates and awareness so that everything has been considered uh, from a, not just a physical disability, but vision loss and hearing loss as well. Um, and is, is it publicly available? I believe it is. Okay. And, and uh, door, yeah, Christian says, door widths never seem to be wide enough. And that is true. And even in my own house, um, I have 36 inch doors and it, it's, it's really about speed and how fast you're trying to get through those doors. I was in my house for a week and I ran into um, the door frame in my daughter's bedroom again, which is 36 inches. And I, and I chipped the woodwork like the first week we were there and I was so mad at myself, but no matter how careful you are, you're still going to run into doors, but certainly there are doors that need to be wider than they are. And it's those old buildings Great, so I do see um, just some additional activity in the chat box. I'm gonna quickly pull that up. So one individual okay. writes, how do you convince organizations slash rationale to obtain this to go beyond code requirements? When you look at it from the perspective of the percentage of the population that it affects, um, that's maybe the place to start start with that idea that 21% of the population in Canada identifies as having a disability. When you expand that to friends and family, that affects 50% of the population. And if you, are, um, if you are a business and you're trying to increase your customer base, then you want the business of that 50% of the Canadian population. And a very large, I think it's like 73% of the Canadian population will choose to you know spend their money in whatever way whether it's a membership at a gym or at a restaurant to spend their money and make a choice for a place that is accessible so that's a that's a place to start anyway Please share areas of conflict, i.e. the heavy fire doors and the little old ladies like me trying to open these heavy things. Yes, Marguerite, so very true. And I don't know if you saw the video of me trying to open the heavy washroom door at the beach. Um, I had posted it on my Facebook uh, at the accessible washroom, of course, so heavy that I couldn't even open it from the inside. And I was lucky that there was somebody outside um, to open it. So fire doors have to be heavy so that they close in an emergency but if um, if they are a door that are um, you know readily used they they should have a door opener on them mm. 
Excellent. So I'm going to draw your attention to two more questions in the Q&A box. Okay. Yep. Um, wondering about the best resources for finding bathroom equipment, particularly tub lifts. Mm, that is a little bit out of my scope. Um, what the, the organization that I work with is Ontario Home Health, but that's, um, that's as best as I am able to help you there. Yeah, and, and Han says, uh, that's a good point. In this time of COVID, why would you want to exclude customers? Exactly, you want people to get back into your buildings. Um, I'm just going to put my email in the chat so um, you can just copy and paste that if you like. Oh, that was supposed to be to everybody. I will do that again. And look forward to hearing from you and um, feel free to visit my website. I will share that uh, seven things not to do when building for accessibility. And I also am on Friday launching a new online course that's all about bathrooms, building better bathrooms, um, accessible bathroom design and construction is the name of the course. And I, my goal is just to help people have bathrooms that work for them, um, especially focused on residential bathrooms. Uh, Francesca is asking, are new, build alternate, are new build alternate level of care facilities required to be RHFAC certified? Um, no, they are not required to be RHFAC certified, but they are required to meet the minimum code of the part of the country where that is being built um, in Ontario, that would be the Ontario Building Code. And like I said earlier, if they are to just meet what is in the Ontario Building Code, they would not be certified um, because the, the Building Code does not go, um, it does not go beyond what is code and is not geared to best practices. And that's what RHFAC is focused on. It's focused on best practices. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Marguerite. <laughs> um, so fun. we, and if anybody has any last minute questions, we'll stick around for a minute or two more. But in the meantime, I just wanted to thank you. Thanks, Julie, so much for, you know, again, this great webinar and everybody seems very, very engaged. And um, thank you to all our participants for engaging in this great discussion. Well, and, and thank you for having me. I mean, what a great opportunity for us to get together and start a conversation um, about accessibility and and really that's that's what it just has to be. You just have to start the conversation with your colleagues, with your um, with your patients, with your clients. Ask them what what are they struggling with in this building, and then start talking about it. And you will find that it's not going to break the bank to make some small changes that will make a big difference for the people that you are working with, either the staff themselves or. Um, like I said, your, your clientele, your patients, your, your clients, your guests, however you refer to all of the people that you spend your days with, make their lives better. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. So again, if you have any other questions, do reach out to Julie. She's included her um, email address and website information in the chat box. And again, they're also in the slide deck, which will be circulated in a few days, and it's also posted on Loop. So we're approaching the end of the webinar now. Um, so when it has ended, you will be redirected to Zoom, as I had mentioned before, and you'll be invited to participate in just a very quick short evaluation survey. So all you have to do is click the blue continue button on your browser and then you'll be redirected there. And um, as always, we'd appreciate any feedback that you can provide so that we can continue to offer high quality loop webinars um, like the one you just experienced. So, and there's also, again, I had circular, maybe I'll include it again, just the, um, the feedback link also from Rick Hansen. So I'm just throwing that in the chat box there as well. So do complete um, both evaluation surveys if, if you have the chance to do so. So uh, that again, brings us to the end of the webinar. So thank you all. Thank you, Julie. Thank you participants um, for tuning in today. And uh, we hope that you have a wonderful day. So see you guys next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you.